Thank you. Uh, I'm actually here to talk to you today about the future uh, and how um, the BBC, like uh, all other businesses, needs to think about the future um, all the time. Uh, and uh, the BBC is in quite a unique position in the way it has to think about the future, but I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, we begin with uh, how the future looked in the 1950s. It was all going to be about uh, glass houses uh, and flying cars, uh, which didn't um, quite come to pass. Um, one example about things which have been difficult to predict in the past are communications. Here's a 1968 idea of what communications would be like in 2001. There was a bit more of that clip, but it stopped a bit early. Anyway, you got the idea. Um, that's from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, and in that world, you had to go into a phone booth to place a call, uh, like a video phone box. Uh, and if you kind of ignore the fact that um, they also thought we'd be traveling in space in uh, zero gravity wearing business suits, uh, uh, the phone is just not ambitious enough. Uh, another example of communications predicted in the past. This is 1966, Star Trek. Uh, set in 2260, uh, they thought that would be how we would be communicating. Um, and of course the reality is we're in 2015 and we can do uh, all of the things that uh, uh, were predicted in those uh, two 1960s uh, predictions of communications in the future uh, in our hands today and um, probably uh, a million times more computing power than they uh, ever imagined. But Arthur C. Clarke, who actually wrote 2001, uh, he wasn't bad on the predictions. This is him in 1964 on the BBC's Horizon programme, and let's hope this clip plays all the way through. Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation because the prophet invariably falls between two stools. If his predictions sound at all reasonable, you can be quite sure that in 20 or most 50 years, the progress of science and technology has made him seem ridiculously conservative. On the other hand, if by some miracle a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everybody would laugh him to scorn. This has proved to be true in the past, and it will undoubtedly be true even more so of the century to come. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So. If what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll fail completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable, have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. Let's start by looking at the city of the future. Some people think that it will be like this. And they're quite right. In fact, everything you see now already exists. All the materials, all the ideas, these things can be put into practice immediately. But what about the city of the day after tomorrow? Say, the year 2000. I think it will be completely different. In fact, it may not even exist at all. Oh, I'm not thinking of the atom bomb and the next stone age. I'm thinking of the incredible breakthrough which has been made possible by developments in communications, particularly the transistor and, above all, the communication satellite. <laughs> These things will make possible a world in which we can be in instant contact with each other, wherever we may be, where we can contact our friends anywhere on Earth, even if we don't know their actual physical location. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali just as well as he could from London. In fact, if it proved worthwhile, 
almost any executive skill, any administrative skill, even any physical skill, could be made independent of distance. I am perfectly serious when I suggest that one day we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New Zealand. When that time comes, the whole world will have shrunk to a point. And the traditional role of a city as a meeting place for man would have ceased to make any sense. In fact, men will no longer commute. They will communicate. They won't have to travel for business anymore. They'll only travel for pleasure. Now, that's pretty incredible, I think, for 1964. Arthur C. Clarke, um, apart from the fact he... Uh, uh, only has men in the workforce uh, still, um, predicting um, much of what happened, um, that you can be in contact with anyone on earth without knowing exactly where they are, which is what you had to do in 1964 because you'd had to phone them on a landline. Uh, and that um, cities, um, we might not be there yet, but they are increasingly becoming places of leisure rather than places of shopping. And uh, most new uh, shopping centres being built in cities are being built around leisure, cinemas, eating, uh, rather than the actual shopping experience as more and more goes online. So um, I think that's an incredible prediction of the future. One more, uh, one more prediction. Uh, this is a slightly more recent. Uh, this is from a Hollywood movie called The Net in 1995. Um, and this stars Sandra Bullock. Uh, and this is correctly predicting what the internet could be used for. Actually, a long, long time before it happened. And you may uh, think, well, we can do that now. But back in 1995, this did seem incredible. That was incredible back in 1995. Wow, they've invented uh, ordering a pizza online, um, which Hollywood thought was kind of like, we'll make it look really futuristic. Um, so why am I talking to you about the future? Well, the BBC at the moment is thinking about um, uh, between now uh, and 2025, 2027. And the reason is because uh, the BBC has a, a unique way of being funded, which uh, is called the Royal Charter. Uh, and it has to put forward proposals for the next 10 years, um, uh, every 10 years, uh, when it renews its Royal Charter, which affects its funding and also what it can actually do um, uh, in the real world. So uh, most businesses have to bid it the future. Um, the BBC is, is quite a strange cycle in that it comes around every 10 years. And so every 10 years it has to sit down. I love the way these post-it notes are slowly floating off the walls. Um, every 10 years has to kind of sit down and think, what are we going to be like uh, in 10 years' time? So the last charter uh, renewal uh, was back uh, in um, uh, the mid-2000s, and it predicted uh, catch-up TV, uh, the growth of the PVR, and the invention, before it happened, of the BBC iPlayer. So uh, in the charter, in the document that the BBC put forward to the government uh, for its funding, it said, the next big thing is going to be um, getting your television online, and we need a system to do that. We're going to create the BBC iPlayer, and that will be um, uh, one of the big things in the next 10 years. Uh, they were right, it launched on Christmas Day in 2007, and of course, it's been a huge success. Um, but you can't always predict behaviour. So, um, I'm going to ask you a question now. How much TV viewing do you think is on catch-up? The BBC predicted it would be between 40 and 50% by now. Um, when it put its charter document in originally. So uh, anyone would like to hazard a guess at uh, the percentage of viewing that is um, catch-up, either on PVR or on the iPlayer? Throw me a number. 75. 75. Okay, any other numbers? 60. 60. Okay, so you think the BBC got it wrong by uh, underestimating it. The actual figure is 11%. Yeah. 89% of TV viewing is still live. Um, that doesn't mean it wasn't a really important invention, it wasn't a really important uh, uh, thing to have done in this 10 years, but it shows you how you can't predict behaviour um, and it's uh, extremely difficult uh, to know exactly how people are going to use the things that you do. Um, so where are we going at the moment? Well, um, the subscriber numbers in uh, the last year for both Sky and Virgin Media have gone down as people find ways to access new uh, ways to access entertainment. We've got um, 
things like Apple TV, uh, we've got uh, Chromecast, um, and people choosing uh, what they pay um, to watch. 80% of TVs in 2016 will have an internet connection, uh, and there are widespread predictions that TV and radio revenues will, uh, commercial radio revenues will fall. By 2017, 95% of the UK will have super fast broadband access. So what does that mean for disrupting the television business? Um, equally, the BBC as a public service broadcaster has to be aware of universality. So we have to be, you know, almost every single person in the country can get a BBC broadcast through television or radio at the moment. Um, but um, by 2017, eight million people won't have broadband access at home. They'll either be in what's called the final 5% of people who are too rural uh, to get a signal, uh, an internet, a decent internet signal, or there'll be uh, people who can't afford it. Uh, and one of the issues that the BBC has had in the previous charter renewal is it didn't quite take the economics of a lot of these things into account, like the iPlayer. Uh, and the assumption was, well, by 2015, everyone will have broadband access and everyone will want to pay for it. And of course they didn't. Uh, the reality is that not everyone can afford it. Um, so. Um, the BBC, as a universal service, has to uh, make its service available to all licence fee payers. So you can't just switch off television and radio's traditional broadcasts and say, we'll do it all on the internet, because there are people who can't afford it and people who haven't got it. Uh, this is a very poor joke about the fact that 40 million people uh, will have tablets by 2017. Obviously, I'm talking about those tablets. I told you it was a poor joke. Uh, and the other thing I want to talk to you about is the ability to predict things that just come out of nowhere. So in the last charter period, we set out all the things we were hoping to do over the next 10 years, uh, and this was in the mid-2000s. Um, social media, of course, has only really exploded in the last uh, 10 years, so we had no plans for it, we had no staffing for it, uh, we had nothing in place to be able to cope with that, so we've had to take resources out of other things we planned to do in that 10 years to cope with something new that came along. So Twitter's only eight years old, it's got 271 million users, and of course the uh, juggernaut is Facebook, um, which only became a public site eight years ago. So 10 years ago, when the BBC was last going through a charter renewal period, the idea that we would need to put content on Facebook, uh, which is now one of our biggest drivers of traffic to our website, um, just didn't exist. Uh, and again, going back to the BBC's universality, um, we need to be in all the places where people are. So we are on the television, we're on the radio, but increasingly um, a lot of our audience is online. And I'm not just talking about people of your age and younger, I'm talking about people of all ages. Um, so we have to make sure our content is available there. So what about the future uh, and how we predict the next 10 years? Well, I've got a couple of videos to show you which show where we might be going. Or maybe I haven't. <laughs> Rehearsing is always a good thing as well. Um, let me just see if this will work. We all know that the internet has evolved from being passive, unorganized, No, this one. Play, please. We all know that the internet has evolved from being passive, unorganized, and asocial into something that is now active, alerting you to things of interest, organized with search engines and wikis, and massively social, connecting you to your friends and you with the world on every web page. Remember, Google only emerged in 1998, Wikipedia in 2001, Facebook in 2004, YouTube in 2005, and Twitter in 2006. A world without these services now seems like ancient history, and they are more than just fantastic communication devices that give you access to all world knowledge. They are also memory enhancers. Imagine if we could read Leonardo da Vinci's blog, Charles Darwin's Facebook timeline, or Albert Einstein's Twitter feed. For the rest of your life, you will be able to curate and preserve your stream of thought on these mediums. If you operate a blog, you now have detailed storage of your state of mind that you can keep forever and easily share with the rest of the world. 
Our ancestors didn't have such a remarkable luxury. These platforms allow us to build collections of communities, but we are also joining these communities on new collections of technologies. First the PC, then the laptop, then the smartphone and tablet, soon smart watches and glasses and clothing. Wearable computing is already here. So that's where we are um, and how fast we've come along. Um, and I suppose the whole, the whole point of this is about predicting the future and how, as a business, um, it is the most important thing you can do. And newspapers um, were quite slow to react to uh, the internet and the fact that people were getting their news in other ways. Uh, and you could argue that broadcasters have been quite slow in, in dealing with it because um, we thought it was going to be uh, that the internet is about the written word uh, and we do the spoken word or the uh, visual word, if you like, in television um, and that it wouldn't really affect us in quite the way it's affected newspapers. But it is uh, and it's, it's very quickly becoming uh, a way of people getting their news and not only their news but other utilities like the weather. Uh, the BBC Weather app uh, is one of the fastest um, growing, if not the fastest growing app on uh, any platform in the UK ever. Um, and travel news is increasingly uh, going online. So a lot of the things that people traditionally came to our broadcast media for, they're now going to uh, the internet for, which is why we are now having to take it a lot more seriously uh, than we had. And trying to predict the behavior of the next 10 years and people's behavior over the next 10 years uh, is a really crucial thing at the moment, and it isn't easy. So um, what do the experts think the next 10 years the might involve? Things might be next. A world where all physical objects are seamlessly integrated into the internet. Our vehicles, our homes, and all of our things, equipped with simple wireless sensors and infused with microscopic computers. This would result in a world with 50 to 100 trillion objects online, which is the goal of Helen Deuce, director of the RFID Center at Cambridge. We would be living in a planetary environment sensitive and responsive to our presence, something computer scientists are starting to call ambient intelligence. If Mike from Idea Channel isn't already right in declaring the offline online distinction meaningless, an Internet of Things world would definitely eradicate this distinction. You wouldn't need to go online. Online would be everywhere and everything, and it would be the medium within which all human communication took place, all seven or eight billion of us, all the time. This medium may also include artificial intelligence, Think Watson-like AI embedded into the internet's architecture. Probably I'd help you. A Google search in 2030 will likely include a natural language conversation with an AI, so it will be a much more personal and intimate experience where you can get answers to questions that can be logically deduced from algorithms sifting through all the information. Several research groups are also working on full immersion virtual reality that can become integrated into the internet. Mm bringing social media, websites, and discussion platforms new reach and further blur the lines between real reality and virtual reality. So the Internet of Things is next. How that affects broadcasters, uh, how um, we take, perhaps take some of that data uh, and uh, use it to tell stories, or how people might not need to be told stories because they can already get it through uh, devices, um, is a big question and uh, impossible to predict for us. So 2025 uh, is um, 10 years away. It will also be interesting to see how that video, the last one there, looks compared to the Arthur C. Clarke one looks, uh, which is um, 51 years old now, um, in 50 years time and whether any of those uh, predictions turn out to be accurate. As Arthur C. Clarke said, if they don't seem uh, fantastic enough, they're probably not going to come true. So that's the future. Uh, that's what I was here to talk to you about. Um, uh, just a little bit about me. My name's Stuart. I'm the head of BBC East Midlands. So that's uh, Derby, Leicester, um, Nottingham and the surrounding areas. Uh, we make programmes uh, for, for that area and I'm happy to answer questions either about the future or the BBC in general um, and uh, what we do. Fire away. I think the only uh, likely uh, reason we would do that is if we were forced to because I think um, BBC generally um, doesn't think that's a great idea and I think commercial broadcasters more importantly 
would hate that because obviously we have um, very compelling content and we're better to sell advertising at a very high rate. Um, and the commercial broadcasters, uh, we've just become more competition for them. So um, I, I can't see that happening in the short term. Um, I, th I think it all comes back to the universality uh, and there are people who are not interested in news but love EastEnders and there are people who want to get their news uh, in um, developing countries through WhatsApp from the BBC and there are people who want uh, to get it through the BBC website. So um, as there are more and more platforms and more and more things, um, the BBC has uh, endeavoured to be relevant to everyone by being in all of those places. Um, you could argue that in some of that, some of that has created a, 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 we're a bit too thin in some places, um, and perhaps we should focus on some of the bigger uh, um, platforms, some of the bigger issues. Um, but I think we, ha we, ha we are supposed to be there for everyone. Um, and, you know, I work in regional and local news and, um, you know, there's been a market failure in that area, particularly in local radio. Um, in the East Midlands, there is no local radio. There's only regional commercial radio. We're the only people doing local radio. So um, I think, uh, you know, I would defend that as, you know, absolutely the right place we should be spending money, um, holding people to account and, and, you know, being part of the democratic process. Looking into the future, how is the BBC looking to impact things like hacking, internet hacking, or bootleg websites where we can watch BBC films without paying licenses? How are we going to stop it? How, 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 are, you, <laughs> how, yeah, how, how are you tackling yeah. that? Um, the BBC is in, in, a, in a strange place with that, I suppose, because um, we put all of our content online anyway. We don't charge for it. Um, so at the moment, um, you know, if people put a whole programme up on YouTube, um, it's not quite as bad as if they do it for an ITV programme, because ITV want the revenue from the advertising that might, might be automatically played on their website. Um, we're not quite so worried about it. You've already paid for it through your licence fee. So if you're watching it in Britain, it's, it's not such a worry. That said, you can watch it anywhere else in the world then, and we, you know, we sell our content to other broadcasters, um, and that's, you know, that goes back into making more programmes, so it's good value. Um, so, uh, you know, we tackle it, we try and tackle it in any way we can, but that is largely by talking to the people who are hosting, putting it up. Um, but it's, you know, it's a problem that every broadcaster in the world's struggling with, um, has to be said. Do you think there'll be any need for the BBC local news with technology now because you can get everything that's local on Facebook from your friends <coughs> and everything that's going on with traffic, sometimes you can get it quicker off Facebook than you can before the BBC's even got the information. Mm -hmm. So do you think there'll be a need for the local news when there's all this advance in technology and that people are only interested in global news and things because that they can get the information quicker from alternatives? I hope so. Um, personally, um, I, th I think you know we we you, you're not holding politicians to account and not um, investigating what's going on in your local area on Facebook. Yes, you'll hear about things that are going on, um, but to hold uh, your local council to account so they don't just go off and spend money on crazy projects they love, um, and to investigate what's going on near you, I think you'll always need local journalism, uh, and I think the BBC is is well placed to do that because unlike um, uh, commercial organisations, you know, we have a funding to, that allows that to happen, whereas other commercial organisations have had to pull out because they can't afford to do it because it, it's not cheap. Um, but it, I think it's a very important part of the democratic process that there are journalists asking questions rather than just people sending what they've heard around, which isn't always entirely accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Do you predict um, changes in the way that people pay their licence fee or how BBC is funded? Um, it's, uh, honestly, I couldn't answer that question. I honestly don't know. Um, I suspect we will... Uh, the Royal Charter decides whether there will be another licence fee and straight after the election, the BBC and the government will start negotiating about that. I suspect we'll get a licence fee again this time, but it might be the last time the licence fee is in the current form. But equally, it could all change. 
you know, it's, there's lots of people talking about different solutions. I think there's a different version they have in Germany, which, um, uh, which people are talking about. Um, so uh, there'll be some form of funding for the BBC, whether it is the licence fee or not. I, I get the feeling that probably there'll be one more 10 year period of the licence fee before they completely change it. But I could be completely wrong. I wouldn't want to go on video and say it. You look back in 10 years time and go, what an idiot, he said that. Yeah. Like, it just seems a really outdated yeah. Is there any plan to like, reduce that time frame? Uh, again, uh, this is kind of like me trying to predict whether there'll be a license fee. Uh, I wouldn't like to say, but certainly the last 10 years have shown us that things can move in communications incredibly quickly in 10 years, unlike they have in any previous license period. Um, you know, the invention of colour television didn't fundamentally change everything we do. The invention of um, uh, surround sound didn't fundamentally change it, just, you know, these were incremental changes. The changes we've seen in the last 10 years in communications have been huge, uh, and so, yeah, perhaps, perhaps that should be a, a, a thought. Oh, with microtransactions on the rise as well, what's the BBC going to do, like, in relation to that, like, like future-wise? Well, we don't, uh, if you're talking about kind of micropayments, for, yeah. for content. I mean, we don't charge for content. Um, exactly. So, um, you know, it, it is part of your license fee. It, it is therefore, you know, free, if you like, once you've paid your license fee. So, um, I, I'm, I don't think we'll get into microtransactions. Um, sound like. Okay. <laughs> Prediction here that we'll be in microtransactions. We should record that and watch it in 10 years' time. Any more? Go on. Yep. Uh, well, it's a money-saving idea, um, so that we're not, um, you know, satellite space is very expensive, um, and having a full TV schedule is very expensive, where you can put, you know, if you're online, you can just put certain, you don't have to put a whole eight hours of programming up every night. Um, and also BBC Three's BBC audience is a very distinct part of the demographic, who are much more than 11% online. In fact, it would be the highest number, um, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but um, yeah, you know, there is a, there's a universality argument that, that we're taking that away, but I think um, you know, there's enough other things we do, and the best of BBC Three gets on BBC Two or BBC One anyway, um, that you know, it's a money-saving thing, and as I say, BBC's having to find more money to do things uh, online and find different ways of communicating with people, so we can't keep on doing everything that we've done previously. Wow. Uh, I suppose I would answer that in the in the same way I would answer someone who um, who said, uh, you know, do we have any political bias? In that, you know, in the time I've been at the BBC, uh, I have never instructed anyone to take a particular political view over another political view. Uh, and impartiality, more than anywhere else I've ever worked in journalism at the BBC, is is just ingrained in what you do. And it's every thought is about, are we being impartial? Have we got both sides of this story? Um, and you know, sometimes we get it wrong. Um, and you know, sometimes we have to put our hands up and say we got it wrong. But impartiality in news uh, is is just absolutely ingrained in everyone who works there. And I would say the same about any other issue. Um, I'd say um, you know there is we, we don't try and take a stand that this is better than that. So it doesn't make political No. No. <laughs> any more questions? Preferably not as tough as that one. <laughs> The question was, if you didn't hear, do I believe in the predictions and the visions that we've just watched? Um, I do actually, I'm a big fan of the whole, I, I've got you know, wristbands that do this, that and the other. Um, I, I, I believe in the internet of things, I think we will all, everything will be connected up. I can turn my lights on at home from the other side of the world and my heaters and all of that. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm what you call an early adopter, but I do think, um, I do think that is the way we're going and things will be connected. Um, and whether they happen this fast and whether they affect everyone on the planet as um, 
the, the man said at the end, whether 8 billion people will be really wearing wristbands that tell them uh, where they are on the planet, I'm not sure. But I think a lot of us will be. Any more? The back? I'm, a, I'm next speaker, so I'm cheating around. <laughs> Um, the BBC obviously got involved in Web 2.0. How do you see the BBC getting involved in Internet of Things? And don't say you're going to open the fridge and watch the TV or anything. How is the BBC going to relate to intelligent minds? It's a really interesting question. I think a, a, a lot of it is around uh, the data uh, and whether people trust the BBC with the data more than they might trust Google or um, Facebook. Um, so if there is all of this data out there about what people are doing uh, and the BBC uh, you, you know, at its heart is telling stories, then that data is a great way of telling stories. And we see data journalism, um, you know, newspapers like The Guardian uh, do, do really well on data journalism. So how can the BBC uh, create platform, if you like, for people to trust their data with us so that we can then tell bigger stories about, you know, I don't know how far people are commuting, you know, if, if you can access a million people's um, uh, movements, um, but would people trust the BBC? Um, perhaps they trust the BBC more than big American corporations. Um, so there's some really interesting work going on about how the Internet of Things around those kind of, that kind of personal data could be really interesting um, without exploiting it, but using it to, to, um, to take a big picture of the UK or a particular city or a particular town. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, the, the classic <coughs> Internet of Things thing is the uh, connected fridge. Um, but I, I don't think we'll be getting into selling people um, strawberries because their fridge is empty of them. Any more questions? I'll do a runner then. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for listening um, and have fun.